What I want you to do is we're going to go a little bit off book for just a second. Uh, I was thinking about how to sort of juxtapose three of these passages that I want to deal with tonight together. So what I want to do is I actually want to take a break from Isaiah and I want to fast forward about 700 years to the book of Luke. So if you have a copy of scripture, turn to the book of Luke. If you don't have a copy of scripture, download it on your phone very quickly. Uh, but it's a copy of Luke. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Now what we have in the book of Luke essentially is a well-educated, thoughtful man who is trying to explain the story of Christianity using Greco-Roman historical constructs. In other words, Luke is giving a history, and he's giving a salvation history. Some people think that it could actually be sort of a background material even for Paul's trial. Uh, you know, Paul is going to go to trial in Rome. So Luke wants to provide a legitimacy to Christianity as a legitimate uh, religious and historical movement, not some rogue thing. So the details and the, and the trappings of Luke become very important. And Luke will tell stories that the other gospel authors don't tell, or he'll add details to stories that the other gospel authors tell, but they don't go into a certain detail. What you have to remember is that Luke is not writing his more than likely, so let me put my caveat on there, more than likely Luke is not writing his gospel to be read by Jewish believers, but rather Gentile believers. And perhaps someone who may not even be a believer at all, depending on how you translate, uh, de determining on how you interpret who Theophilus is. Okay, Which, by the way, is what I wanted to name uh, my firstborn son, my son Max. I got voted, vetoed pretty hard, but the name's still out there. If anyone wants to honor the work I do, please name your son Theophilus. Okay, all right. So what you have in Luke is you have a pretty pronounced uh, Advent story. You're all very familiar with it. Uh, you have uh, Elizabeth, and you have Mary, you have Zechariah, you have all these great characters that get thrown in. Uh, you know, we all know Luke 2, all that kind of stuff. In Luke 3 and 4, the beginnings of Jesus' ministry, and what you have at the beginning of Luke chapter 4 is Luke's account of Jesus' temptation in the desert, the 40 days and 40 nights, and then he's tempted by Satan. And then in Luke 4.14, it says this, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. So now we're in Luke chapter 4, verse 15. The first thing I want to point out is in Luke chapter 4, 14, it said he returned in the power of the Spirit. Whenever you're looking at Luke, what Luke is, is doing is he's showing that Jesus Christ was a Spirit-empowered prophet from God and that he was the Son of God. That's what Luke is doing. So when he goes to Acts, when Jesus is not physically on the scene, he now demonstrates that we are all Spirit-empowered prophets of God, just in case you're wondering what's going on, okay? So he says, in, in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, verse 15, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. This was essentially before the crowd, obviously before the crowds turned on him. What Jesus was doing is it says he taught in their synagogue. So here's a few things that we know about synagogues in the ancient world. There's a lot, there was a very popular idea, I was just doing some research on this today, uh, up until about the 70s, our 70s, disco 70s, not their 70s, the 1970s. Some of us remember them. Um, 70s and 80s, that really up to that, it was that the synagogue system had developed in the exile when they didn't have a temple. There's now some modern scholarship that's starting to debate that. But anyway, what do we know? We know that by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, the temple is essentially ignored for the most part, and most religious life is done in the synagogues. Well, you had a couple different types of synagogues. Some were private synagogues. In other words, it would be a synagogue of like all Pharisees, or this would be like the Sadducee synagogue, or this would be like the wealthy people synagogue. And then there were public synagogues. More than likely, Jesus now is stepping into public synagogues. He's never really identified with a school or a, a political faction or denomination, I guess, would be another way of saying that. Uh, he's never really identified. So more than likely, Jesus goes in. Now, what, the other thing we know is that he's doing this relatively often. If you look at the passage, it says he taught in their synagogues. So how does that work? Well, it's interesting. In the synagogue, the guy who's in charge, who's called the synagogue president, just thought you want to know that, he never preaches. He just makes sure everything's there. And then basically, people 
well-respected either rabbis or well-respected men in the community would come up and one person would read the passage of the day and then another person would explain the passage of the day, okay? And basically, people say, oh man, we're doing church like we've never done it before. Friends, we've been doing church the same way for about 3,000 years because we got it from the synagogue, just so you know. Why do we do church the way we do it? Because we got it from them. And what did they do? They sang, they prayed, they listened to someone explain the word of God, and they took up an offering. Sound familiar? I remember one time, never mind. That's one thing. I was a church planner for a while. Those of you may not know that. And one thing that church planners love to do is talk about how they're doing church like no one else. And I'm like, well, unless you're doing stand it on your head, we're pretty much, it's the same model is what I'm saying. So anyway, that's where we get it from. But in verse 16, we have this little nuance. And he came to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So what we probably can, can assume, again, it is an assumption, but I think it's an educated assumption, that this was probably Jesus, basically his home church, if you will. Okay, so those of you maybe who grew up in Coastal, this would be like, and, you know, and, and Caitlin walked into Daphne and walked into Coastal Church and stood up and read you know, from her, you know, that, that's what, that's what we're go, was going on here, right? For me, and Brian walked into North Little Rock, and there walked into First Assembly of God in North Little Rock, and they all said, boo, never mind. No, no that's, that's pretty sure that's not what would happen, although I haven't been in a while. Um, why is all this important? Jesus is essentially in his hometown church, if you will, and as was his custom. So he had been doing this. I think that's critical. This was just what he did. So what we know, what can we surmise, what can we assume? Number one, he had already began to have a reputation as someone worth listening to. Now that's important, and probably since he was about 12, people had been listening to him. We, we do know that also from Luke. He had engaged and been adopted as someone worth listening to, okay? Uh, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. So what you have in the synagogue is um, they would have their building, and sometimes they would have dedicated buildings. Sometimes it would be like a storefront. If you really want to get into something super niche but kind of interesting, the archaeology of ancient synagogues. Anyway, um, but it's really cool. What they had is this, had this little temple in the front, and in the temple, it was like this little structure. In this temple, you'd open it up, and there'd be a copy of the Torah. And sometimes you'd have a complete set. Sometimes you'd only have a little bit. But we know in the Nazareth synagogue, they at least had a copy of Isaiah. So they take out their copy of Isaiah, they hand it to Jesus, and there's like an attendant there. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. So he's, he's interacting with the book of Isaiah now. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now what he's done is he has actually read a portion of Isaiah chapter 61, which we're going to deal with tonight, and he slipped in very casually a portion of Isaiah 58. And if you're not, if, again, there's a lot, why doesn't it sound exactly the same? He's reading it more than likely out of a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, so stuff gets moved around a little bit, but that's what he's done. And then he says this, and he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, because that was somebody's job, and a little scroll boy there, and scroll boy would bring it up, and he'd read it, and you go, here, scroll boy, and he would say, thank you, and shalom, or whatever, and he'd say that to them, and then he'd go away. Now, normally what would happen is somebody else would come up and start to teach the passage, okay? So you had a reader and a preacher. But Jesus says, he rolled up the chair and he gave it to the attendant and he sat down. Now this is unusual because he stood up to read, which is what you did, and then he immediately sat down. So what this means is he's breaking some of these societal norms, okay? Some, those of you who've heard me teach on Jesus, remember that you've heard me say, Jesus is not sort of this passive figure in his own story. Jesus is constantly doing provocative things to draw attention to his role as Messiah. This is one of those. 
Oftentimes when you hear people try to criticize the historical Jesus, maybe you've watching something on the History Channel, or you've caught some, you, you caught a bad YouTube, you know, you got a hold of a bad YouTube or something like that, and they'll say, well, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. It's patently untrue. He's constantly drawing attention to the fact that he believes he's the Messiah. By the way, everyone who was really close to him also believed that he thought he was the Messiah. The only people who don't believe that he thought that he was the Messiah are people who have lived 2,000, you know, 1,800 years farther than where he ever left. I mean, they're completely removed. So this is one of those moments. He sat down. And look what it says in verse 20. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. They were wanting to say, what are you going to say about this passage? Why? This passage comes from Isaiah 61, which we'll get to in just a moment. And this passage was, in fact, a couple of things. Number one, it was a messianic passage. It was one of the servant passages, but more than anything, it was a revolution passage. Because this passage sort of told when the day of the Lord was finally going to come. What we in our context call the end times, the last days. Jewish readers read this passage as one of the signs of the last days, the servant anointed servant would come in and he would take on this yoke. So they're basically saying, Jesus, are you about to say that we're going to get to throw off Rome? Are you about to say that the, the kingly Messiah with the fire in his mouth and the lightning in his eyes and his lightsaber and his force lightning, like, is he going to come? His x-ray vision? I mean, they really had a lot of stuff. You know, so some believed in a kingly Messiah. Some believed in, like, the teacher Messiah and all. The, and they're like, are you saying? They were really saying, hey, you've, you've poked the bear here. You've said something provocative. What are you about to say? And he says this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus never said he was the Messiah. He just did. He said, I am fulfilling this today. And what's interesting is they don't immediately get outraged. They spoke well of him and then marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Dallas, you'll quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, so he had already done some miracles, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet... Is acceptable in his hometown. You can't go home again. He said, truly I say to you, but in truth I tell you, there were many, wit many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heavens were shut up, there were three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. He said, and by the way, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue, synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up, they tried to throw him over a hill, but he sort of snuck out. He may have actually just sort of walked through them. Why did they get so mad? He says this, today, this is filled in your healing, in your, in your, in your hearing. I'm it. All right, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? And I say, now, I know what some of you say, Okay, show us. Do the miracles you did in Capernaum. Jesus essentially says, I could do them, but they're not going to work on you guys because you're not going to believe me anyway. They start to get a little offended. And he says this. Don't you think it's interesting that the two greatest prophets, Elijah and Elisha, their greatest miracles were performed to Gentiles? The widow at Zarephath, she's from Sidon. She's a Gentile. Naaman was from Syria. He was a Gentile. And that's when they lose it. Because what he's saying is he's saying, this is fulfilled, but the reach will be far more than the nation of Israel. Jesus has stepped into their understanding of what this passage is supposed to be, and he's revolutionized it. And he has broadened it from their understanding. But now that we can go back to Isaiah 61 and pay attention, we'll see that Jesus never changed the meaning of the passage at all. Okay, and this is one of those great things where we sort of over time, in fact, we were talking about this uh, today. Over time, we sort of hear a passage taught so many times we think we know what it means, right? And I was with Pastor John and Pastor Sidney today, and we were talking about this very issue. 
One of the most prominent ones as we get into this time of year, and some of you may be thinking, oh, you know, I need to get a gift for my grandkids or, you know, I've got a graduate maybe this, you know, coming up in the spring, I should get them something. And so we get them like a little pillow or we cross stitch them something, maybe a doily, maybe a nice little sign that hangs up and it'll say, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, give you hope and a future. And we're like, oh, that's such a beautiful graduation verse. The problem is, is that verse comes at the tail end of God saying to Israel, I'm going to destroy you, break you down, break you in half, make your life miserable. You're going to regret it. It's going to be horrible. But hang in there because I know the plans I have for you. Don't worry. And some of you are like, yeah, it sounds like freshman year. Actually, no, that's, that's completely appropriate, actually. Right? Uh, one of my favorite ones is I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. That's my favorite, that's my favorite verse in the Bible, right? And it's the same thing. They had developed a teaching of this passage so often that they had forgotten what the passage in some ways actually said. And what we find in Isaiah, we've talked about it already, this term, but what we find in Isaiah is the increasing inclusion, the circle of God, the tent of God, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At one point, God has Isaiah prophesy to people like eunuchs, and say that you will always, even though you've been castrated and even though you have no ability to reproduce and even though you're sort of put on the bottom end of the totem pole, you know what God tells eunuchs? He said, you will always have a family in God. He says to foreigners, you'll always be a part of our nation. So there's this realm of inclusion. And what happens is Judaism, in its myopic sort of approach, narrows that out and they leave that out. I know Christianity, we never do that. We do it all the time. It's human nature, right? We like people who look like us, act like us. And so what we see in Isaiah is the broadening. And those of you who've been with us this whole term, you'll remember some of those passages. So let's go back all the way to Isaiah chapter 61. This is in a uh, section called the anointed servant, the anointed servant. And it's Isaiah 61 and 1 all the way through 62 verse 12. Okay. So let's start with the first stanza of this, the anointed servant. Isaiah's oracle is going to connect the Messiah, the anointed one, to the servant. Now those have sort of been floating out as, if if you wanted to read Isaiah in such a way, you would see those as almost two different characters. You have the servant who's going to suffer, and by that redeem Israel and all humanity. And then you you have the anointed one, like Cyrus and some others, who through their power and strength are going to deliver Israel. Okay, and that's a couple of our last few weeks sort of glommed together. What 61 does is he takes both of those beings and says they're actually going to be the same person. The Messiah and the servant will be the same one. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, he says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Throughout the Old Testament, when everyone says the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, it typically is a sign of wisdom, it's a sign of insight, and it's a sign of supernatural ability that the Spirit of God is always tied with a few things. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament is always tied, number one, with supernatural insight and wisdom. It's always tied to the miraculous, and it's always tied to proclamating, to proclaiming speech. For those of you who come from my background, the, the Pentecostal charismatic background, I can do a whole thing on why we speak in tongues and how it's related to speech and all that kind of stuff. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, um, Stick around. We'll have a class on it eventually. All right. But that's what we'll do, okay? Don't, don't worry about it right now. We don't need to worry about it right now. <laughs> I know some of you are sweating. You're like, you're not going like, to do it, are you? No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Um, but that's the sign. In fact, in many ways, Isaiah 61 almost sounds like a king being coronated. Like a ki- it's what a king would say when they were being uh, invested, when they were being coronated, okay? Saul said similar things. The Spirit of God came upon him. David said similar things. The Spirit of God came upon him. Uh, We know from the book of Judges that when when a person had to rise up and lead Israel with either insight or power, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. In fact, the tragedy of Samson was what? He got up, the Spirit had left him, and he didn't even know. Okay? So there's that tie that goes together. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because, here's why, why does God give the spirit his or the servant his spirit because the Lord has anointed me. And there you have the tie between the servant figure from 53 and 49 and the anointed one. So the Messiah and the servant are now the same person. 
sort of forge welded together, if you will, in this passage. And he has anointed me. He has endorsed me. He has called me. He has empowered me. He has set me aside. All of those meanings with anointed go in there. To do what? To do this. To bring good news to the poor. He has empowered, set me aside, called me to bring good news to the poor. Okay? That's what the Messiah, the anointed Messiah, is here to do. Now, what we have then oftentimes is we say, oh, you mean the spiritually poor. Well, it doesn't say the spiritually poor. It says the straight up poor. Now, this is where your own thing's going to start coming into play. What I mean by that is your own natural spiritual preferences and biases, you can actually read, you will read them into this text. Because I will read these next several passages and some of you will say, yeah, it's about time somebody talked like that around here. And you'll say, yeah, it's about the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden. And you'll say that and your heart will leap. That's because the word of God matters to you and the word of God as it, is it applied to the suffering of this world matters to you. Some of you will read it and you will say, yes, there is a deep spiritual brokenness and people are spiritually bound and people are spiritually captive. And when I read these passages, that's what you'll hear. And that's because your commitment to the word of God speaks more to the transcendent metaphysical idea of our interactions. And who's right? Yes. <laughs> yes. To read one at the expense or at the ignorance of the other is to read the passage incorrectly. So when he's saying the poor, he means people who ain't got no money. Right? He means the poor. By the way, the word poor in the Old Testament, it's a big word. It doesn't, doesn't mean broke. It means broke, like flat broke, busted broke, like straight up broke, like broke broke, right? <laughs> he has sent me. Okay, so what do we know? He has anointed me, verse 1. And then in the second half of verse 1, and he has sent me. So we know that this now anointed servant is both commissioned, anointed, and sent. Now, this is, this is a big part, because if we go all the way back, right, to Isaiah chapter 6, who will go for us? Whom will we send? There is this idea now that the anointed servant, the, 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 the servant Messiah, will now go beyond. That he is not just delivered to Israel, but he is sent into all the world. He is pushed out. To do what? And there are five of these. He has his, his new job description has five things. Number one, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Okay, so there's two of them. To bind up, to proclaim. Remember, there's that idea. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The year and the day, you're kind of like, well, which one is it? Those are both metaphorical words. It is a season that the, the advent of the kingdom of God is arriving. I am proclaiming that. To comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. Anybody? Thank you. I appreciate that. Just the one. Two? Tough room. Okay, all right. Pray in the spirit. All right, okay. What has he done? He has said, this is what I'm here to do. Number one, the spirit of God came on me. And this is, he's speaking as the voice of the anointed servant. So imagine the anointed servant saying, the spirit of God came on me and I have been commissioned, empowered, set apart, uh, profiled, detailed, whatever word assigned the job of bringing good news. Now, this is not the same type of good news as would eventually form the word gospel, in case you're wondering. This good news just means good news. <laughs> like, hey, this is exciting stuff, okay? And not only am I here to talk about it, I am here to do something. So this is not just a proclamation. This is an actual commission, not just to proclaim good, but to do good. And for some reason, Jesus, 
when he is ascribing this passage to himself, throws in a line from Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is not the commissioning of a person. In some ways, it's the commissioning of God's new people. And in the beginning of Isaiah 58, God sort of goes after fasting. Fasting is sort of a pointless exercise. He says, you know, you fast, you don't eat, but what good does it do? And this is what he says in verse 6. And it's really tough language, by the way, if you read 1 through 5. And I always think of like all the ways that we figure out to fast without ever actually giving anything up. I don't know if you've noticed, we, we try to do that sometimes. People always say, well, what fast should I do? I say, I don't know, don't eat. Well, what if I just, you know, and I do that. I do that, all, I'm not going to get into that, okay. And you can buy books on different fasts. Here's a fast that God says. How about this? Is this not the fast I choose? This is God speaking. Here's the fast I, here's the fast I want you to do. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. That's the verse that Jesus sort of hedged in there. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? He's saying, here's what I'd like you to fast. Why don't you fast being wicked? Here's something to give up for Lent, oppressing people. Hey, when you don't eat, why don't you, instead of just not eating the food and saving it for later, why don't you give the food to the hungry? Like, don't just be spiritual, do spiritual. And that's what he's saying here. And he's saying, then, when you really get this at heart, then shall your light, and he's talking to the nation, the people of God, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. He's saying all of this spiritual power that you want, I've told you how to do that. So when the, when, the, when the anointed servant is talking about his mission, and then Jesus sort of slips this verse in, he is binding these two missions together. In other words, the, let, me, let me say it more plainly, if you're looking for something to write down. The mission of the servant is the mission of God's people. They are not separated now. In the same way that he has taken the anointed one and the servant and bound them together, he has taken the mission of God towards the servant and the mission of the people of God and bound them together. And when Jesus sits down and calls them to do that, he is saying, I am that one and you will do what I do. And in some ways, according to um, there's an academic guy named Roger Stronstad. According to Stronstad, that is the whole point of Luke and Acts, is to demonstrate that we are all, in fact, now prophets who are called to proclaim and demonstrate the year of deliverance, both spiritually and physically. And so that's how those two passages tie together. It says this in verse 4, they shall build up the ancient ruins. Oh, actually, let me, let me go back to the second half of verse 3 that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, instead of Israel being a display of God's justice and God's judgment, Israel has now become a display of God's righteousness. That's that oak of righteousness. I will put you on display, he says. And instead of sort of being a joke to the world around you, I'm going to raise you up. But I will raise you up because you are doing greater things than military conquest, um, monetary power, all of the values of the day. You are doing the work of God, freeing the oppressed, freeing the slave, all of that sort of thing. Okay? They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And we know, of course, this comes true starting in 538 B.C. So this is the idea of that anointed one, the connection between the Messiah to the servant. The next one is the blessed people, now the people of God. These passages express the promise of God to fulfill his commitment to Israel and use them to spread his word throughout the world. One of the big question marks that hang over Israel is, okay, you've judged us, but you said we were going to do all of these really great things. Are we going to do that too? It's not unlike when you promise your children, well, if you clean your room, we'll go get ice cream later. And then they don't clean their room, and they get in trouble. 
So now you have a little bit of judgment. But then they wind up cleaning your room, and a smart kid will say, well, do we still get ice cream? And God's answer is yes. True grace is always getting ice cream. Okay? All right. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. Now, this sounds like they're going to flip the script, and now they will take captive over people. It sounds like now they will be the oppressor. But look how God just changes the nuance here a little bit in verse 6. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord, and they shall speak to you as the ministers of God. In your freedom, you will not become oppressors. And in their service to you, you will not oppress or bind them. He is saying you will not become the very thing that you suffered. All right? By the way, that's a beautiful example of what freedom really is. Because oftentimes we take on the very attributes of the things that hurt us, and we wind up cycling those back out and doing the very things to, us, to others that were done to us. And God says that's not restoration. Restoration is when you are actually serving the very people who once perhaps hurt you or the type of person. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Verse 7, we get the exchange. There's lots of exchanging in Isaiah, right? Instead of shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land they shall possess a double portion, and they shall have, now look, everlasting joy. So now God is talking about an eternal kingdom. So let's take a few pieces together and look at them now through the messianic, through the lens of people redeemed by Christ. Because remember, Christ says this passage is about him. Okay? He's saying that when I come, I will do the thing God's always called us to do. We will actually do it together. And that will result or it will be a part of an eternal kingdom. So what Jesus is saying, when he says things like, you know, he that believeth in me will not perish but have everlasting life. When he's talking about a city whose builder and maker is God, when he's doing all of this, he's not, he's not shaking the world. What I mean by that is a lot of times we think Jesus was introducing these revolutionary concepts that no one had ever heard before. But if you pay attention, Jesus is bringing to life and perhaps reframing things that have been talked about for centuries. All the world, all the nations, justice, peace, hope, all of these things have been there. Look at what he says in verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. So God is saying in this passage, justice will be done. I have to have justice done. Okay? I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Why would he say this? He said, because I made you a promise, and it would be unjust of me to not come through on that promise. God said, I've made you all sorts of promises, Israel. I've made my people all kinds of promises. Why would I rob you of that promise? I am doing everything I can to bring that promise about. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the peoples, who shall see them all, acknowledge them, now that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. Israel will not disappear. In their judgment, in their suffering, in their decline, Israel will not disappear. And God, as a part of that, will never dishonor or disobey his own covenant. He won't do it. Now the voice switches. We have a new character, and this is actually the voice, sort of the uh, personalized voice of Zion. The people of God now speak. And they speak back. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in the Lord. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. In this stands in verse 10, we see the idea first off of renewal. I will rejoice because I have been renewed. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with jewels, I am renewed. And that renewal is almost like one of like, it has the joy and the intimacy and the commitment of like a wedding. And he said, I would wear like a bridegroom's turban and the, and the, and, and the bride adorns herself. And then he switches the metaphor again, right? So he's spinning all these metaphors, right? 
He says this, For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up where? Before all the nations. So they are renewed, they're committed in, with God, and they are fruitful. All the things that would have come into question during their exile, right? Are we going to make it? The question of renewal. Do we matter to God? Is he still with us? The question of commitment. And then we are broken we are hurting. We don't have our fields. Our cities are ruined, all that kind of stuff. Their own abundance and fruitfulness. And God says, I will turn all of these and bring them back. Why? When am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? I will do it before all the nations. You, Israel, is to be the primary evidence of the mercy and the restoration of God as patterned or, or, or as compared with his justice. So that's 61 all the way up. And then in 62, we move on to this idea of Israel no longer being forsaken. And, and there's a lot of it that, get, that gets repeated. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. There's that idea of proclamation, of speaking, okay? Until her righteousness shall go forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. There is this again. We think oftentimes that when we see the suffering of Israel, we, we tend to kind of make it a little unfair. What we don't realize is that suffering on display to the nations is seen as justice. And justice tempered with reconciliation, now that becomes righteousness. It says you'll be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed. Now they have four names, okay? So four names come up. First one is forsaken. No one will call you Azubah. That's your first name. You will not be called forsaken. I'm sure Israel was like, people have been calling us that? Like, God's like, you didn't know? Oh, I thought you knew. I'm like, who called us that? Oh, just some guys at work. All right. And your land shall no more be termed desolate. Shamama. That's just a great word. You're like, oh, but don't name your children these first two. They're horrible words. And then he says this, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. Hefzibah, Hefzibah. You know what God loves to do? I don't know if you've noticed, there's a little motif in scripture. God loves to change names and name things. And in the, old, in the ancient world, name and identity went hand in hand. And God is saying, I will actually change the conversation over you, including the internal conversation about yourself. And although this may be a prophecy given to Israel specifically, again, we've talked about this, there are still oftentimes embedded promises for all of us in that idea that the dialogue spoken about over us by ourselves, by unloving people in our lives, by the enemy of our soul, there, there's a dialogue spoken over us. And God says, I will, in some words, reverse that narrative. And instead of being forsaken, you will be called, my delight is in her. Instead of desolate, and your land will be called Married, and the word for married here is Beulah. My parents grew up in Beulah land, assembly of God. Where does that come from? Right here. Some of you may remember the old gospel song, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. And no, because you all have not been kind, I'm not going to sing it. I'm thinking it really loud, though. All right, but this is it. You will be Beulah, you will be... You will be married. You will be restored. I want you to, the reason I'm going through all this verse by verse is to really pick up the powerful word images. I want you to get that sense of the mission to accomplish restoration. These are not just words. These are activities. There is a doing that is critical to all of this. And that, perhaps of all lessons, is one of the biggest ones to take away from Isaiah. Isaiah focuses so often on proclaiming this day of God that will come one day in which all nations will be redeemed. And here in these last few chapters, he's not just proclaiming it, he is calling us to engage in it. And we have to do that. We are invited to do that. And I wouldn't even say we have to do that. That's probably really bad language. We get to do that. We get to participate with God in the redemption of the universe. It starts with some of these passages. 
For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The bride of God now. And now this language. Paul would later pick up this language when he refers to the church as the bride of Christ. And when we use that term, what are we talking about? It's joy, it's intimacy, it's closeness, it's family, it's that sense of, of just being bound together. Verse, starting in verse 6, the section on the watchmen, he says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise on the earth. People are really kind of confused about this. Because what are the watchmen there to do? Are they to watch out for Israel? No, because Israel's going to be okay. Are they to watch out for the enemies? There's nothing about the enemies. Are they like, watching out for God? What are they there to do? They are there to stand in whatever, whatever they are. And if you, it's total speculation as to what they are. But essentially what they are is there to say, God, don't forget. God, don't forget. Not that God's going to forget. But they're that mutual reminder that God was going to accomplish this. And then he says this. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. God is telling Israel, you're no longer cursed. You're no longer under judgment. You, you're not anymore. And in fact, those who now come to enjoy your fruit will come into my kingdom to enjoy it. Now, this could be seen as saying, oh, well, tourism is Israel. It's going to be amazing. Or what does that mean? The greatest fruit of Israel, the greatest bloom from the tree of Israel, from the sprout of Jesse, is the Messiah. And he's saying that they will come through you, and the Messiah will come through you, and all the nations will enjoy that beautiful fruit at least that's how I read it, that beautiful fruit of the Messiah. Those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Now the nations will come through you, and through the Messiah the nations will come to me. So what do we do finally? I'm sorry, joint themes of perseverance and prayer are emphasized here. He's saying don't give up, they don't rest, all that kind of stuff. That's how it's connected, all right? And finally, prepare the way. This is another section of Handel's Messiah, but again, go through Go through the gates and prepare the way for the people. So he just said all of the nations are going to come and enjoy the fruit that is the Messiah of my people, which is you. When you do these things that I've asked you to do, you'll be completely restored. That restoration will be a powerful symbol to all of the world and a powerful message to all of the world that I'm a good, just God. Therefore, people will now want to come and share in that promise with you. So what are you to do? Prepare. Prepare the way. <clears throat> God calls his people to act on what they have heard. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift up a signal over the peoples, right? These are prepare the way for the nations to come to the holy city. We talked about highways, ease of travel, a signal is just a light. He's literally saying, go out there and make a way for people to come into the city of God. He is giving in metaphorical terms, he's commissioning the people of God to bring the outsider inside. <clears throat> so when Jesus tells the parable of the, of the wedding feast, and all of the people who are, who are expected to be there won't come. So in the story, Jesus has the, the guy who's giving the feast. He said, go out to the highways and the byways. Bring everyone who was invited. You know what? They can come in. He's not telling a new story. He's reminding them of the same story. That Israel was always intended to be a light to the nations. That the nations could come in and find peace with God. And in the same way, we now have the mission of the church. What is the mission of the church? To go prepare the gates. Make it, make a clear path for people to find God. Not always an easy path, not always a straight path. 
Jesus talks about the narrow way. He talks about all kinds of stuff. But remember in Acts 15, even the apostles themselves said, we should not burden the Gentiles. We should not make it hard on them to come into the people of God. So clear that way out. Because behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. In other words, your wage, that's the reward. What you've earned is there. And the recompense, your penalty is there. So he's saying, in light of justice, prepare the way. The righteousness of God is coming. Salvation comes. And when he comes, he will bring your salvation. He'll bring judgment on the nations. So you need to prepare a way for the nations to find him. And they shall be called. And then again, he starts giving them names. And now they shall be called the holy people. The redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called sought out. And look at the final name he gives this city. A city not forsaken. That they have gone in this full circle cycle of judgment. From being cast down, cast out, kicked aside, thrown out, deported, exiled, their walls broken, their temple burned, their monarchy destroyed, all of that kind of stuff. And one of the last things God says to them through Isaiah is that now your new name, when all of this is accomplished, is a city not forsaken. And the message for us now is we say, okay, Jesus appropriated this passage and brought it unto himself. And so when Jesus brings this passage onto himself and then he commissions us, he is binding us, his people, to this same passage. Jesus is saying this to us, that in your restoration, in your salvation, in your renewal, in your commitment, in your hope, you are now called to prepare the way for others. You are the one now that keeps the gate wide open. You are the one that makes the path straight. You are the one so that people can come and you now become, you just as Jerusalem became this powerful image of restoration when it was restored, just as Israel as a people become a powerful illustration of God's ability to restore his people, so you as an individual are a powerful testimony of what God can do when he restores. Many of us, all of us, have had to come to terms with the reality of our sin and the judgment of God. And that's what we found in the first half of Isaiah. What we've also, is in the second half of Isaiah, found the hope and the salvation that comes because of his anointed servant who took the suffering on us. <clears throat> Justice was served, and it was served through Christ so that he could extend mercy towards us. And that really, with a few more chapters to go that we can't get into, is the heart behind the book of Isaiah. Let's pray. God, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your love. And now, God, as we go into our question time and our final time of discussion, God, I pray that you would just bless everyone. God, in this off season, as we take the next couple of months away from each other, Father, I pray that you would just favor them, give them blessing, and let them feel closer to the power of your spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. That's Isaiah for now. Go ahead and enjoy your discussion time together.